Welcome to Tech Empire. I'm Michael Quet, joined by my co-host, Siamo Malachi. Today we have on the show Zoe Baker. Zoe is a trans anarchist historian who did her PhD on the history of anarchism from the 19th century through the Spanish Civil War. Zoe, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. All right, so in this episode, we're going to talk about anarchism. In particular, we're going to outline what it is, how it emerged, its distinction against Marxism. Uh, we're also going to talk about anarchist takes on technology, anarcho-syndicalism and unions, uh, nationalizing property, and other things. Tech Empire is part of the Yale Podcast Network and could be found on SoundCloud, iTunes, and YouTube. On Twitter, visit at Tech Empire Cast. You can also check out uh, Zoe Baker on Twitter, and she has a YouTube channel. All right, so let's just start from the top here. Um, Zoe, what is anarchism and how did it arise? So this is a question where kind of almost every anarchist will have a different answer. So I'm just going to give what I personally think, but it should be kept in mind that, you know, people disagree. So in my opinion, Anarchism is a form of anti-state socialism that first emerged in the 19th century, and it seeks the abolition of all systems of domination and exploitation in favor of a society in which everyone is free, equal, and bonded together through cooperative social relations. And anarchists think that in order to achieve this goal, we have to abolish capitalism and the state as well as a wide variety of other oppressive social structures, such as patriarchy, racism, uh, the oppression of disabled people, the oppression of children by adults, and so on. And their goal is uh, what I call an anarchist society, and it has four main characteristics, although it's, it's much more than these four. This is just a summary. So the first characteristics is that humanity as a whole uh, collectively own land, raw materials, and the means of production, as opposed to today under capitalism, where these things are overwhelmingly owned by uh, capitalists, by the ruling class, by corporations, uh, rather than by uh, people themselves, uh, rather than by workers. And anarchists think that those who occupy or use a piece of land uh, raw materials and means production on a daily basis should directly control and self-manage that relevant sphere of production or distribution. And individuals will still own possessions which they use uh, that they aren't using to exploit or oppress anyone with. So, for example, under this social system, uh, humanity collectively own a watch factory. Those who labor in the watch factory directly control and self-manage how production of watches is organized, what watches they make and so on. Uh, and then individuals will own their personal watches as possessions. So those are kind of the property norms that anarchists want as uh, anti-state socialists. Alongside that, they think that decisions in uh, workplaces and communities should be made by people themselves within general assemblies in which everyone has a vote and an equal say in decisions which affect them. And these then, the, these local assemblies then coordinate over a large scale through social networks and through uh, formal federations, which link them together. And the third feature is that anarchists of the anarcho-communist and anarcho-collectivist variety, uh, they want to abolish markets in favor of a system of uh, decentralized planning as opposed to uh, centralized planning. So it's, it's planning that is from the bottom up, uh, in which information flows from kind of local communities upwards, rather than uh, when you have top-down state planning by bureaucrats. Uh, and the fourth feature is that the rigid capitalist division of labor is abolished, uh, such that people do a combination of mental and physical labor, and unsatisfying labor is either removed, automated, or shared among workers. And so this doesn't mean that no one will specialize in any skill. Uh, so, for example, some people are still going to have to uh, specialize in learning how to drive a train or do brain surgery or how to build houses that don't collapse. But the point is that this won't be the only sphere of activity that they engage in, such that they won't only drive trains or build houses. They'll do a variety of different things. And what this means is that we don't have a situation today where you have people whose entire lives is just being cleaners. Uh, instead, people do combinations of different kind of work and share out the uh, more unpleasant work and as much as possible try to try to get rid of that uh, unpleasant work. 
And this would also go alongside a significant reduction to the working day. So historically, anarchists lived in societies in the 19th century where people were working 12 hours a day, sometimes more, uh, and they were advocating a three to four hour work day. And that was with 19th century technology. Obviously, things are, things are different now. And who knows what could be possible? Now, anarchists uh, share this goal of a stateless, classless society uh, with other kinds of socialists, um, in particular Marxists. And so anarchism isn't just categorized by a, a critique of existing society and a vision of a, of a free society. Uh, it, it also is committed to specific strategies to achieve this goal. Uh, in particular, it rejects electoral politics or seizing state power, and instead argues that social movements should engage in direct action, which is when people act themselves to achieve their emancipation, rather than relying on intermediaries or representatives. Uh, and they do this outside of and against the state. So anarchists are against participating in the state. I think social movements should remain outside of this. And the long-term goal of this direct action is to work towards a social revolution, which means a transformation of society at a fundamental level in which the working classes expropriate the capitalist class and thereby to take over collective control of the economic sphere and also overthrow the state uh, in favour of these networks of community and workplace uh, assemblies that I was talking about before, which will enable workers to self-manage their lives and reconstruct society uh, to achieve uh, the vision of an emancipated society. So that's what anarchism is. And I can then briefly go through, well, how did this social movement uh, arise? Now, this is unbelievably complicated. And so I'm just gonna go through a very kind of uh, broad brushstrokes uh, summary. So what happens is that from the 1840s onwards, there are a bunch of different people who call themselves anarchists. And what these people have in common is that they advocate the goal of uh, stateless socialism, uh, so socialism without the state. And then what occurs is that in 1864, an organization is formed called the International Working Men's Association, which is a organization that is meant to, meant to coordinate different working class social movements uh, around the world in order to achieve their shared objectives and create a sense of kind of internationalism among workers from different countries. Now, within this uh, organization, the First International, a tendency emerged, which was committed to the following main positions, which was uh, the goal of collective ownership of land, raw materials, and the means of production, revolutionary trade unionism uh, as a strategy to achieve that goal, and the view that capitalism and the state should be abolished through an armed insurrection, uh, which would forcibly expropriate the ruling classes. And this was distinct from uh, other social movements at the time, such as a social movement called mutualism, uh, which was in favour of um, peaceful uh, change and rejected armed struggle uh, as a strategy, and also uh, rejected the collective ownership of land, but was in favour of the collective ownership of the means of production. Now, this new tendency that arises, it uses loads of different labels, uh, such as you know, federalist, collectivist, revolutionary socialist, but anarchist and anarchism are the labels that stick, and that then becomes the dominant term for this social movement uh, between the mid 1870s to early 1880s. Uh, now, this tendency, the social movement first really emerges uh, within uh, the, the Jura part of Switzerland, uh, Italy, France, and Spain, and within those sections of the first international. And so there are a series of congresses uh, in Spain, Switzerland, and Italy where they adopt uh, programs which are opposed to electoral politics as a strategy. So they're opposed to state socialist strategies in favor of what would later be called uh, anarchist strategies. Uh, there is then a split in the first international between supporters of Marx and Engels, who are famous uh, state socialists who advocate electoral politics as a strategy, uh, and the anarchists. And this culminates in the formation of what's called the Sintimir uh, International in 1872, and that Congress is organized overwhelmingly by uh, anarchists, although the Sintem International isn't uh, fully full of anarchists until 1877. And during this period when it's emerging within the first international and then the Sintem International, it isn't this kind of purely uh, European um, social movement. So it spreads 
during its emergence of, uh, as a social movement to uh, Latin America and to kind of other parts of, of Europe than kind of just like France and Italy. So by the um, 1877 Ver Congress, which is the final Congress of the Sintem International, uh, there are anarchist groups um, attend the, um, the Congress uh, from Switzerland, Italy, Germany, Spain, Greece, Argentina, Mexico, Uruguay, uh, and Egypt. Although it should be kept in mind that the, the, the anarchist group in Egypt are Italian uh, immigrants uh, that have moved and, and brought anarchism uh, with them. And so from its emergence as a social movement, anarchism is uh, international and is across uh, multiple continents even though it does first emerge in Europe very rapidly, it ceases to be a purely European um, social movement. And so according to the historian uh, Benedict, Benedict Anderson, uh, he claims that um, international anarchism was the main vehicle of global opposition to uh, capitalism and domination by uh, feudal landlords and autocracy and, and imperialism between the late 19th century and the kind of start of World War I in 1914, and that at this point there are anarchist movements, not just in Europe, but also uh, North America, South America, Asia, uh, Oceanus, Australia, New Zealand, and also parts of Africa in particular, uh, South Africa. And the other thing to keep in mind with the international character of, of anarchism is that, for example, there are larger anarchist movements in places in Latin America, such as Argentina or Brazil, than there are in some European countries, such as uh, the Nordic countries. Uh, so it's not the case that it's like mainly big in Europe and kind of exists elsewhere. It's actually larger in Latin America than it is in some places uh, in Europe. Uh, and the other thing to keep in mind is that when, for example, anarchism spreads to Asia at the beginning of the 20th century, it's not just that they kind of repeat what the uh, European anarchist authors like Peter Kropotkin uh, say, they also um, combine those ideas with their own distinctly uh, Chinese or Japanese or Korean uh, intellectual traditions, but also immediate context. So for example, they develop theories in response to Japanese imperialism, because that's the main kind of imperialism they're having to deal with, rather than, uh, say, uh, a German uh, imperialism uh, within Europe. Or they uh, uh, focus on how to incorporate the insights of, say, historical Chinese philosophy like Confucianism uh, and Taoism with the anarchist theory uh, that they've read in European authors. And this leads them to develop uh, new concepts, uh, such as the Chinese anarchist He and Jen's uh, analysis of, of, of gender as a social construct. She achieves that analysis through um, bringing in concepts from Confucian philosophy and then critiquing them from an anarchist uh, perspectives. So they're not just repeating European authors, they're also developing their own new distinct ideas. And that's really important to emphasize. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, Eric Hobsbawm, the famous Marxist historian, uh, said that around the uh, end of the 19th century, uh, anarchism was the dominant strain of, of socialism. I also know that, or I, I wanted to ask a question um, about Marxism, um, I believe that Marxism picked up really as a is a huge thing after Marx died, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I've seen it been said, but I wanted to ask you, what's the big difference between anarchism and Marxism? There has been some real clashes between the two, but there's also in, within the social community of Marxists and anarchists a lot of similarities and a lot of people might grow up in a tradition in which the first entry point to socialism is either Marxism or anarchism. And then they kind of stick with that label and to emphasize strong differences between anarchists and Marxists, Marxists could sometimes be, you know, self-defeating to the socialist movement, I feel. So I have, you know, for example, also friends from all sorts of political persuasions and and um, I think we could be constructive, but I do personally worry about the rise of authoritarian socialism happening again. So can you kind of speak to the uh, issue of, you know, the big differences and similarities between uh, Marxism and, and anarchism? So Marxism and anarchism 
emerger social movements in parallel to one another. So the first Marxist parties emerge in like the 1880s uh, and 1890s, uh, which is in parallel with the emergence of anarchism as a kind of conscious, like self-identified social movement. Um, and to a significant extent, they kind of respond in opposition to one another. And it should be kept in mind that when anarchists historically critique Marxism, they're critiquing the Marxism of the uh, political parties, which call themselves uh, Marxists. And there's a huge amount of texts by Marx, which are not publicly available at the time, uh, or which even once they become publicly available, don't appear to have been uh, widely read um, by anarchists. Uh, so, for example, anarchists generally base their views on of Marx's strategies on the Communist Manifesto, uh, but they weren't familiar, apart from a few exceptions, with uh, the critique of the Goffre program, in which he makes various critiques of a particular kind of what was called social democracy um, in Germany at the time, uh, in which he, for example, rejects um, state uh, funded co-ops and thinks co-ops are only valuable if workers create them themselves. Bakunin didn't know about this and so wrongly attributes to Marx the idea that he was in favour of state-funded um, co-ops. And so there's a lot of kind of talking past each other that occurs in these debates historically. Everyone misrepresents one another and crucially there's loads of sources that they, they just don't have easy access to or, or don't know about. And so what I'm going to focus on is what is the anarchist critique of Marxism as a really existing social movement, uh, which uh, historically was called social democracy in, in this period, which is in the, the late 19th, early 20th century, before a split that happens when the, uh, the majority of social democratic parties support their relevant states in World War I. Uh, and this then leads to a split, creating a new international who, call, who then rebrand themselves as communists, and that is then a kind of new form of Marxism. Uh, and that's most associated with people like Lenin, uh, the Bolsheviks. And so the, the, the anarchist critique of Marxism as an actually existing social movement, uh, that they make kind of three main predictions about their strategy, which is what the real difference uh, actually is. In terms of social theory, there are loads of uh, historic anarchists who uh, were influenced by uh, Marx's economics, by Marx's theory of history. Uh, there are ones who were ex-Marxists, but when they became Marxists, they retained the commitment to uh, what, you know, what was called historical materialism. There are some historic anarchists who are actually more extreme economic determinists than Marx was. And there are also anarchists who have uh, different social theories to Marx and Engels, but they're broadly similar in terms of how they think about uh, human action and human history. They just disagree about how to think about the relationship uh, between the economy and, and the rest of society and how to like, conceptualise uh, that. But they, they overwhelmingly agree on a huge amount of things in terms of like how they think about uh, human uh, action and what societies are and so on. Now, what were the main strategic differences between anarchism and Marxism during this period? So the Marxists um, were in favour of electoral politics, um, while the anarchists uh, rejected it. Within the Marxists, there were disagreements about the role of electoral politics. So a kind of more, much more reformist version emerges where they, they think we can, we essentially vote our way to socialism. Uh, like we just have to win a majority in parliament, then that majority implements socialism and then things are okay. Uh, but there's also a kind of more radical uh, tradition that views it as this is just a way to spread socialist ideas, win a few, few immediate improvements. But we realize at some point, we are going to have to uh, launch a, some kind of armed uprising that seizes state power through force and then creates a, a new worker state. Uh, so anarchists critiqued both the strategy of, of electoral politics and the strategy of trying to seize state power uh, through kind of violent uh, armed insurrection. So what were the anarchist um, predictions that they made? So they thought that there's this kind of unity between means and ends. So the means you engage in determines the ends you arrive at. And therefore, when evaluating strategies, you have to think about how the kinds of activity you're engaging in simultaneously transform people and social relations. So, for example, when workers go on strike, uh, they don't just engage in actions, but they also can change themselves, like learning how to uh, take direct action, learning how to stand up to their boss, 
And they also change uh, social relations so they can say when media improvements like increased wages or they can build a new social structure that didn't exist before, like a, a new uh, trade union. And so if when people engage in actions, they simultaneously change the world uh, and themselves, then, well, what kind of activity constitutes uh, electoral politics or seizing state power? And how does that activity, what, what means is that constituted by such that it shapes the ends people arrive at, how they're transformed? independently uh, of their intentions. So there were three predictions made. So the first prediction is that state socialists were wrong to think that you could just enter the existing capitalist state, transform it from within, and then use it as a tool to build socialism. The capitalist state as it exists is this hierarchical institution which perpetuates the power of the economic and political ruling classes, and that this would transform them rather than them transforming it. So people, uh, politicians would be uh, corrupted by the exercise of power and would become concerned with expanding and maintaining it uh, rather than to working towards the goal of socialism. And this wouldn't necessarily happen because they kind of become like evil villain caricatures with like big mustaches. Uh, anarchists thought that socialist politicians would do awful things to preserve and expand their power while thinking that they were doing it to advance the cause of socialism because they come to view uh, their position of power as indispensable to the achievement of progress. So therefore they have to protect their power at all costs, even actually results in them damaging uh, social movements. Uh, the second prediction was that uh, socialist politicians would be forced to make compromises uh, due to the inherent nature of electoral politics. So in order to win elections, you have to secure as many votes as possible by appealing to as many people as possible, including uh, people who aren't socialists, who'd otherwise uh, vote for uh, Republican or liberal uh, political parties. And so this need to appeal to as many people as possible would force these socialist politicians to reduce their political program to very minor reforms to capitalist uh, society. And then the socialist uh, parties would have to form alliances with capitalist political parties to form coalition governments to pass reformers in parliament. And so these uh, different pressures on the party uh, will independently of people's uh, in, intentions result in them increasingly diluting their political program such that, you know, that they begin with this kind of, um, they had the, a minimum program, which was the immediate reforms under capitalism, and then this maximum program, which was the kind of social transformation they wanted. And Ankus thought that what would happen is that over time, and increasingly so, the maximum program would become something that just existed on paper, or the minimum, minimum program was all they actually even attempted to do, if that. Uh, and then in the long term, the maximum program would be abandoned and all you're left with is the minimum program, which is essentially uh, welfare programs uh, under capitalism. And then the third prediction they make is, well, what about the, the, the kind of more radical state socialists who wanted to seize state power uh, via an armed uh, uprising and create a new worker state that was meant to achieve uh, the self-rule of the working classes themselves, uh, what they called um, the universal democratic republic. So a true uh, a democracy in which there's kind of power to the people. While anarchists thought that the state is an institution that is actually incompatible with the goal of achieving uh, power to the people or of the working class being able to uh, rule themselves. Uh, and the reason why is that the state is this centralized and hierarchical institution and so on a day-to-day -day basis, it can only actually really be wielded by a minority of people, uh, such as politicians, uh, heads of police, generals, high-ranking bureaucrats. And this minority, even if they are uh, democratically uh, elected, uh, will develop distinct interests uh, from the, the working classes and become a new political ruling class who use state power to serve their interests and, and reproduce and expand their power uh, rather than uh, the self-rule of the working classes. And so as a result, the worker state can never actually be created. It will just be a standard state with a ruling class uh, that claims it is a worker state, but actually uh, isn't. And they will become concerned uh, with expanding and, and, and their power over the working classes and reproducing it and, and dominating the workers. And so over time, the workers will have less and less uh, control of their lives, even if at the beginning of the revolution uh, it expands. Uh, and so therefore, anarchists thought the state can't wither away because uh, it's self-reproducing. It has to be deliberately overthrown. Uh, 
Now, all three of these predictions came true, uh, which is quite unprecedented in terms of like people making predictions about the future using like social uh, theory and, like, and sociology. This kind of rarely happens. Uh, so it was the case that socialist politicians were transformed by the exercise of state power and then used this power to repress social movements. Uh, so in France, there's a politician called Briand who was a hardcore socialist, an advocate of the general strike. He joins the government as the Minister of the Interior, uh, and he then crushes a French railway strike in 1910 by arresting the strike committee and conscripting the railway workers into the, arm into the army. Uh, and if, if they're forcibly conscripted, it means they're subject to uh, martial law. And so if they refuse to work, they can be court-martialed and potentially executed for di disobeying military orders. So this kind of former socialist uses state power to crush a strike in quite a spectacular manner. And he's just you know, one example. Parliamentary uh, socialist parties, which began as revolutionary, became less and less socialist over time until they were, as the anarchists predicted, a best proponents of kind of welfare states under capitalism. And we can see this in the fact that the phrase social democracy used to just mean Marxism. That is the historical term for Marxist social movements. Uh, Lenin uh, viewed himself as a social democrat for most of his like revolutionary uh, life, and, and this is why. And now social democrat just means welfare programs. And the reason why is because the anarchist prediction came true. Parliamentary politics had this effect on socialist parties, independently of, of people's in intentions or goals. As for the third prediction, well, there have been multiple state socialist revolutions, which have successfully seized, seized state power via armed struggle. So the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution. But as anarchists predicted, these didn't result in the self-rule of the working classes. They resulted in one-party dictatorships in which the working classes were oppressed by a minority of the socialist party leadership and the state bureaucracy itself. And these societies, um, with respect to, say, China, have now just become straightforwardly uh, capitalist. They're not even kind of uh, historic, like kind of state socialist societies where you have the state uh, owning and controlling the economy in the interests of workers. It's like you know, it's a now a straightforward capitalist economy, which is, uh, means that yeah, the, it hasn't even kind of created the foundations from which socialism uh, can arise. It's decayed into... Uh, one of the most oppressive capitalist regimes uh, that is, you know, exists at the moment. So yeah, so that's the main differences between anarchism and Marxism as really existing social movements. Uh, in, in most cases, there are a few like kind of minority tendencies of Marxism, such as council communism, which do have a lot more in common with anarchism, although they are distinct. And this is also separate from the question of of what Marx himself thought, because uh, there's a different because. Marxism itself was constructed based on a few texts by Marx and Engels and a variety of other people within a social movement, uh, rather than exactly corresponding to everything that, that he thought, which isn't to say he wasn't influential, but it's like, it's, it's kind of sometimes it's framed as, well, if Marx said this, then it means anarchists aren't critiquing Marxism. It's like, well, they are critiquing Marxism. It's just that Marxism of, social, of the actual social movement is in some respects different to Marx himself. So yeah, I hope, hope that answers the question. Yeah, and more than that, I think you also answer a lot of the follow-up questions I'm sure Mike and I would have thrown at you. So I definitely appreciate their precision, but also how layered your responses have been so far. Uh, I think before we continue the conversation and go more into a lot of the practical talks about anarchism, I just want to go a bit more into the weeds of our definition and explanation, especially historically. So does this definition preclude pre-capitalist collectivization. So maybe if you read Sam Mbia's African Anarchism, which suggests that anarchism is rooted in a lot of African collectivist practices, which are pre-colonial, that kind of practice isn't a response to capitalism, mercantilism, colonialism, slavery, etc. It's a, a way of life and engagement with life world, you know, that Mbembe might talk about. So in a lot of the African context, there seems to be the search for a pre-colonial way of living. And some of that has been described as anarchist in character. So I, I think my first question is, I wonder how would you think about anarchism, not just as a response uh, to you know, capitalism, oppression and exploitation of labor, et cetera, but you know, as a, a pre-existing way of life that in many perhaps indigenous communities around the world was already practiced where workers already had democratic say, you know, and we can go into more of the specific details. 
of how you know pre-colonial societies were set up. But I think a second question, uh, and I find it really interesting, you said that communism branched out, or Marxism more specifically, branched out during the war into communism, and then you didn't really get into the second branch. So I, I'm really interested to hear what that second branch was after World War I, and what the primary anarchist response was at the time to World War. And then I think the final thing I just want to mention, especially given our definition of anarchism, uh, in what ways do you believe a lot of anarchists historically responded to the problem of imperialism and colonialism? So if you go back to that practical example of the watch factory, I, I believe in Italy, you know, uh, how would they view where the cobalt was coming from for their watches or the mineral ore? If there was any kind of unequal exchange between where I am here in Africa, for instance, and, you know, European in industry, were they, was there an anarchist commentary on colonialism? Historically, was there a sense that all workers need to be counted equally? So if there was labor done in an African country to take out the mineral ore, there should be a lot of decision making by those Africans about what's happening with those minerals, um, you know, historically speaking. <laughs> That's a lot. Um, OK, uh, so the first question I, you know, what about the existence of kind of uh, what you might call anarchism as a way of life prior to the emergence of explicitly anarchist social movements. So historically, a lot of anarchists made a distinction between anarchism and anarchy. So anarchy is their goal. Uh, and by this, they don't mean disorder. Uh, they mean a society without authority uh, in which people are free, equal, uh, they're bonded, bonded together through cooperative social relations. Uh, and they thought that anarchy could be achieved by, you know, many different means. And there would have to be a process of experimentation to, to figure out the best social forms to realize this goal. And anarchism is the social movement which emerges in a historically specific uh, set of circumstances, uh, initially within Europe, to achieve that goal of anarchy. Uh, but they don't think that they invented the goal uh, of anarchy or that no uh, societies have ever come close to achieving it or that there aren't societies um, which have already um, kind of aimed uh, for, for this before. And so I would refer to these kind of other kinds of social movement or other societies which have uh, organized in an anarchistic manner as examples of anarchy in action. Uh, but I wouldn't use the label of anarchism to refer to them because I think we should not be anachronistic and not impose uh, later uh, categories uh, onto kind of earlier histories. Or in the same respect, I, I wouldn't call the Zapatistas, which is a contemporary example, anarchists. I'll call them Zapatistas, even though some of the Zapatistas are anarchists. So I'll call them anarchists because they view themselves as anarchists. But the ones who don't view themselves as anarchists, I'll, I'll call them what they want to be uh, called. And, and so I very much agree um, that, that anarchistic forms of life have existed around the world. And, uh, you know, Kropotkin, for example, uh, thought that uh, early, you know, uh, humans um, developed political philosophies and social mechanisms to reproduce uh, horizontal ways of life without the state. I didn't think this was kind of like a new idea that, that European anarchists ha ha had invented. And I think that anarchism as a social movement in different contexts should draw upon uh, those previous traditions or uh, other social movements. Um, so I think it makes a lot of sense, say, for contemporary anarchists to uh, learn about uh, the Zapatistas and, and draw uh, ideas and inspiration from their experiences, just as I think that anarchists around the world and not just in Africa should draw uh, upon uh, different experiments in kind of collective egalitarian or horizontal living uh, within different uh, societies in Africa uh, across its history. And I think that can very much enrich the anarchist tradition uh, and make it better than it is if it's kind of, you know, just focusing on what did some dudes in the 19th century happen to think, all right, like I think anarchism has always been more than that and, and should continue to be more than that and should be enriched by uh, other, other political traditions and uh, can learn a lot fr from them. Um, as for the, so the second question was about anarchism and uh, colonialism, as far as I recall. That, that's the third one. I think the that's second the third one. one. Okay, that second one, one is the, the third international. Okay. Um, so this is very complicated. Uh, so, so within 
during it so with, with world war one the majority of social democratic parties uh, vote for war credits and and essentially side with uh, their respective um governments this leads to a split in the formation of what's called the third international uh which we calls itself the communist international uh in which key people such as lenin is involved in and, and they when the and then the russian revolution happens and they are committed to enabling a kind of international um revolution by coordinated communist parties and trade unions which are subordinated to those communist parties which are in turn ultimately under the influence of the russian uh, you know, communist party to achieve the kind of the goals of socialism primarily ultimately through uh, armed struggle and the seizure of of state power through that they do also advocate electoral politics but they don't emphasize it as much as certain kinds of previous second international marxism uh, did and they think that this is kind of the form of marxism appropriate to the conditions of early the early 20th century and the kinds of imperialism that are going on in that so they think that the the marxist revolution is going to emerge in countries subject to imperialism and and colonialism as opposed to previous forms of marxism which thought that the revolution was going to emerge in the most industrialized nations uh, like britain and germany uh, this then didn't happen and the revolution emerged in kind of pre-industrial to industrializing uh, russia and so they then thought well this is kind of what's going to keep happening where the, the revolution is going to be happening in the periphery rather than in, in the core and so that should be the, the focus and so then the, there becomes this connection between marxist revolution and national liberation uh revolution against uh, colonial and imperial powers which is distinct from a lot of kind of second international uh, marxism which was kind of less good on imperialism colonialism than, than later uh, forms of um marxism and even sometimes viewed it as actually a good thing because it was developing the productive forces so this takes us neatly to the third question which is well what did anarchists think about colonialism and imperialism uh so it's really important to emphasize that historically uh anarchists were explicitly in favor of universal human emancipation they um opposed um racism and thought that the emancipation of the working class uh, could only be achieved internationally so they didn't think you know if all the uh, societies in europe rise up and achieve socialism that's kind of the end point they think that we have to achieve socialism uh everywhere rather than just in kind of the, the imperial core and this kind of commitment to working class internationalism was uh, really really important to them so like my tester for example had this slogan which is a common italian anarchist slogan which is the whole world is our homeland all humanity are our brothers and sisters so they want the abolition of borders and and this kind of formation of like a universal humanity who are all free rather than just say focusing on european emancipation and this led them to oppose kind of racial oppression uh both kind of uh you know around the world but also say within european or uh, western countries so malatesta for example says that uh any worker the oppressed chinese or russian or from any other country is our brother just as the property owner the oppressor is our enemy even if he is born in our hometown so workers irrespective of where they're from have common class interests as workers which are opposed to uh, all uh, capitalists uh, um irrespective of of what nationality uh, or or race they are now this commitment to working class internationalism led anarchists to oppose uh, imperialism and colonialism so in the united states italian anarchists were strongly opposed to columbus day celebrations and they would uh, publish articles in which they described columbus as an insane as an enslaver who massacred people and set the stage for future future uh, racial oppression uh, in america the french anarchist jean grave he rejected the idea that france was bringing civilization to africa and he praised the haitian revolution explicitly uh which is when slaves kind of rose up and emancipated themselves uh, from french colonial rule uh, 
And he argued that the Haitians were in fact superior to the French because they had you know, fought for their independence. And he does this even though he himself is French. And this is kind of, you know, this is not a popular opinion in France at the time. And so anarchists were very much going against the grain of what was a lot of dominant ideas uh, in their respective um, societies where there, were, where there was a huge amount of racism. And they, they didn't just oppose uh, imperialism, colonialism, but also kind of developed theories about what it was caused by principally capitalism and the state as institutions. Uh, so there's both economic and political causes. Uh, so the need to establish new markets and steal resources, as well as take out kind of economic rivals, um, but also crucially issues of you know, the, the states um, reproducing itself through patriotism uh, and militarism, and this leading to, say, the army acquiring interests to pursue colonialism, imperialism, which go alongside the economic motivations uh, to do it. It's also the case that you know, people think they're serving the nation by signing on and joining the army and then going to Africa to spread civilization. And they're kind of socialized into various myths about the kind of heroic soldier, which they're going to be. And one of the main anarchists who actually theorized this is a Japanese anarchist called Putoku uh, Shusui. Uh, and he wrote a book called Imperialism, uh, monster of the 20th century in 1901, which is before Lenin's imperialism, the highest phase of capitalism, which appears in 1916. Uh, at the time of writing, he Kotoka was still a, a supporter of electoral politics, but a few years after uh, the book comes out, he, he's committed to anarchism and, and rejects uh, electoral politics and continues to kind of be committed to his views uh, on imperialism within this kind of context of, of Japan. And one of the things that um, Kotuku focuses on is that one of the main uh, causes of imperialism in the sense of kind of territorial expansion, uh, you know, through military force or through you know, diplomacy, but with the threat of violence, is, is patriotism. Because what occurs is that people come to identify with their nation state and the ruling class who controls the state such that, say, a, a person in Japan is socialized to be loyal to the emperor of Japan and come to view themselves as belonging to a different country, to uh, enemies from other parts of the world who they learn to fear and hate and view as a kind of a, another. And so these Japanese soldiers, they then will fight to conquer land and resources for Japan uh, as a nation, even though the people who benefit from this territory expansion aren't the majority of Japanese people, but this kind of ruling minority at the top. And so patriotism is the mechanism through which the majority of uh, Japanese people come to mistakenly think that their interests align with the interests of the ruling class uh, against uh, workers in other parts of the world. And so Kotoko is kind of, I think, important for emphasizing that you won't understand imperialism if you just look at economic factors, although they're obviously very important, because one of the core ways it's reproduced is through, uh, among other things, patriotism and without that patriotism states aren't going to have a large group of people who are willing to go and fight and die uh, to pursue the interests of the ruling class now as for kind of anarchist uh, opposition to it um, this went alongside a support of national liberation movements um, so anarchists over and over again were explicitly in favor of uh, social movements which sought to uh, overthrow imperial and colonial uh, oppressors, even if those social movements were, say, Irish Republicans who wanted to create a new uh, I Irish state because they thought that it was, you know, so important to um, oppose uh, the imperial powers, but they didn't uncritically uh, support these other social movements. They also thought that the goal of those national liberation movements can only actually be achieved uh, through a anarchist social revolution, which overthrows both economic and political oppressors. And they thought that if you overthrew the uh, foreign uh, imperial power and replaced it with a new uh, national government, what would happen is that you've replaced a set of ex uh, largely, I say, external oppressors in favor of uh, internal uh, oppressors rather than achieving um, emancipation. So, for example, there's a uh, Indian anarchist called MPT Acharya, and he, his background was uh, Indian nationalist and anti-colonial movements before he became an anarchist. 
Uh, he was one of the co-founders of the Communist Party of India in 1920, but by 1921, he's adopted anarchism. He's uh, kicked out of the Communist Party in India and then kind of goes in a very different direction. And as an anarchist, he, he remains committed to Indian independence from the British Empire, whilst arguing that this can only be achieved through anarchist means. And it's you know, for this reason of if you see state power, you get a new minority ruling class rather than the self-determination of Indian people as a whole. And so after India won independence in 1947, uh, Acharya wrote an article in 1950 where he says that nothing has changed under, under the Republic ex except the skin and dress. And I, I think this is kind of a critique of the limits of national liberation movements, which I think is, is still very much relevant, that even if they do achieve something very significant, such as say, yay, we're not ruled by the British Empire anymore, uh, they result in new forms of, of uh, class rule and new forms of um, oppression, which can in certain respects be worse, even if in other respects they're better. But the point is they're not emancipation, which is what people are struggling and, and fighting for. And this, this commitment to opposition to colonialism, imperialism, support of uh, national liberation movements, you know, wasn't just the perspective of uh, anarchists of colour like Achaya or uh, Shifsui in Japan. It was also common among you know, European anarchists. So, for example, uh, when the British Empire invades Egypt in 1882, uh, Malatesta actually travels to Egypt to try to fight the British Empire. Uh, he ends up getting arrested, so doesn't able isn't able to do that. But it still shows his level of commitment to opposing imperialism. That he was willing to put his life on the line, uh, even though it wasn't for an explicitly uh, anarchist uh, revolution. And I think one kind of Good, good example of this, this anti-imperialism is in 1895, uh, Italy invades Eritrea and Ethiopia, and Cuba also kind of rises up in independence from the Span Spanish Empire. And in response, the Italian anarchist paper, uh, The Social Question, uh, published an article in which they wrote the following. They say, we know that our patria is not the land where we were born, but that for us, it is the highest concept and no more limited than the entire universe. We know that we ourselves give absolute solidarity to the oppressed of Italy, to those of Abyssinia, of Armenia, as well as the glorious insurgents of Cuba and the strong and courageous exiles of farewell Siberia. That finally, we, without distinction of color, race, language or custom, share affection and adoration for all the oppressed of humanity. Uh, and several Italian anarchists actually went and took up arms and fought in Cuba uh, against the Spanish Empire. Uh, one Italian anarchist actually goes so far as to assassinate the Spanish prime minister due to his uh, involvement in torturing Spanish anarchists, but also because he repressed the independence movements in Cuba and the Philippines. Um, Malatesta also travels to Cuba and you know gives talks supporting their struggle against foreign aggressors were also repeating the anarchist point of you shouldn't shed your blood for national independence only to become subject to domestic tyrants who are as bad as the foreign ones that you've just overthrown. And so, yeah, so that's a brief summary of kind of anarchist views on colonialism, imperialism. And as for how this relates to their kind of vision of a future society, they did think that there should be kind of the different part, the different um, parts of the world should be interconnected through uh, federations and that they should be co-determining production, distribution, you know, at a planetary uh, scale when it is uh, necessary and do so in a way that is as much as possible, you know, promoting equality between different parts of the world and not reproducing kind of like uh, essentially kind of say Euro, 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 European dominance, but in um, kind of a different uh, outfit. And they thought that as much as possible, there should be a shift to more kind of local production, both because in a revolution, what often has happened historically is that, say, the revolution doesn't, you know, it's not the entire world rises up, it's that there's a revolution in Russia, and Russia is isolated, or there's a revolution in Spain, and Spain is isolated. And so in that context, as much as possible, there has to be a shift out of necessity to local production. And I think that in an anarchist society, that also have to go alongside uh, the sharing of uh, resources. So if, for example, due to the legacy of uh, colonialism, Europe has, say, certain kind of technology that 
people in uh, Africa don't have, well, when you achieve a you know social revolution, one of the first things to do should be try to uh, spread that technology such that it can benefit everyone rather than say just benefiting a, a small bunch of Europeans who in capitalist society are able to afford it. And that that will that there needs to be an emphasis on undoing the legacy of uh, colonialism uh, and imperialism within this kind of like socialist society. Obviously, you know that, that's a, that's probably a long way off. All right, so that makes a good segue into the question of what anarchists society might look like. And it's not just theory, but there are some concrete examples in history. And uh, in particular, I'd like to hear you speak a little bit about uh, the Spanish anarchists and also about the theory of, of anarchist, uh, anarcho-syndicalism and maybe some examples of uh, unions that have organized on those lines. In particular, I'm uh, curious about also uh, the beliefs or the uh, views on uh, unions, because in the United States, the union movement was broken down during the neoliberal era, and there's kind of a resurgence in the tech left. But it seems like sometimes that unions are embraced no matter what. There could be issues of you know bureaucratic control and collaboration with you know the ruling class and, and capitalists to quell more radical socialist demands that could arise from workers and have arisen in history. So can you just speak a little bit about the Spanish anarchists and uh, anarcho-syndicalism? Okay, so I'll first briefly explain what syndicalism is, because it's kind of a confusing word. Uh, so in English, you know, so a kind of a syndicate is a, is a trade union but not all trade unions are syndicalist. So historically, anarchists, they're, they're overwhelmingly not English speakers. Uh, and so they don't use the word trade union. Uh, they use various terms such as uh, the society of resistance against capital is one of the kind of, or, or just resistance society for short, is one of the kind of main terms they use to refer to what an English speaker would call a trade union. Uh, and syndicalism as kind of a self-identified ideology uh, emerges in France, and it refers to the idea that you should form trade unions which have a dual function and a double purpose. So the double purpose is that they struggle for immediate improvements, much like kind of normal trade unions, so uh, decreases to the working day, uh, better workplace safety, uh, higher wages, but they don't just aim for those immediate improvements. They also have the goal of a social revolution which overthrows capitalism. Now, in order to achieve that double purpose, they think you have to, trade unions have to be independent of political parties. So they're not tied up with electoral politics and not subordinated to those political parties, such as has often happened where trade union wants to do a strike. The political party is like, don't, because this will affect our uh, upcoming election, and then the trade union is subordinated to the interests of politicians. Uh, the, the syndicates were against that, and they wanted independence of the, the trade union from all political parties. And they thought that the, the trade union has to have this dual function, which is that under capitalism, it is an organ of economic resistance, but it is also, um, the phrase they use is uh, building uh, the new world in the shell of the old, or is the cell or embryo of the future society. And so what this means is that a trade union federation, such as uh, all the uh, trade unions in the metal industry, uh, during the revolution, that is a already existing organization which can expropriate workplaces in the metal industry and then reorganize production, uh, whereby the local unions turn into uh, workers' councils which then self-organize production. And because they're already part of this federation, they are already able to uh, coordinate with each other and so can then effectively do economic organization so that you know, production is still happening, uh, people aren't, say, starving because there isn't bread or because you know, industries collapsed. And so they think that the building up trade unions in the present is creating the organs that can then uh, take over and self-manage a significant amount of the existing uh, economy. Uh, 
Now, there are loads of different kinds uh, of syndicalism, which to a significant extent is kind of repeating ideas that had already been advocated by anarchists uh, from the 1860s and 19, 1970s onwards. But there are some syndicalists who didn't think of themselves as anarchists. And there were disagreements among anarchists who were syndicalists about uh, how to organize the syndicalist uh, trade union. And so there are kind of three main positions I'll very quickly go over, and then I'll talk about anarcho-syndicalism in Spain. So the first view is that the trade union should be politically neutral, and this is called revolutionary syndicalism. And the idea is, is that the, the role of the union is to be this organ of class struggle, which means it has to unite workers as a class, not based on their uh, political opinions. And so therefore, it shouldn't be explicitly anarchist, it shouldn't be explicitly socialist or communist, uh, it, sh it should be uh, politically neutral, although the trade unions which are committed to this political neutrality were also explicitly in favour of like abolishing capitalism. So there's a debate about the extent to which they really were politically neutral, but they were at least uh, you know, not explicitly anarchist, not explicitly Marxist. And they think that's necessary to gather as many workers as possible into one uh, large scale organ of class struggle. And that if, say, you have a Marxist or anarchist union, you're only going to get workers who are anarchists or Marxists, which is a minority, and then you're not going to be able to achieve uh, the goal of the syndicalist union, both in terms of its double purpose of immediate reforms and revolution, and also in terms of its dual function of being an effective organ of economic resistance and building the new world in the shell of the old. Now, in response to that within the anarchist movement, there are two rival positions. So there's what I call syndicalism plus, which is the idea that we need a uh, politically neutral syndicalist trade union for all the reasons that the revolutionary syndicalists say, but that isn't sufficient to achieve revolution. And that in addition to this, we have to form an organization which is composed exclusively of anarchist militants, uh, and that's a specific anarchist organization, and, so, uh, and, and that will coordinate the actions of anarchists both within and outside of the trade union to pursue specifically anarchist objectives, namely you know, the abolition of capitalism, the state, the establishment of an anarchist society, uh, spreading anarchist ideas within social movements, uh, and also anarchist ways of organizing and making decisions. And so to achieve revolution, we need both the trade union and the specific anarchist organization. Now, the third kind is anarcho-syndicalism. And anarcho-syndicalism rejects the idea that the trade union should be politically neutral and instead thinks the trade union should be explicitly committed to the goal of achieving an anarchist society, which historically is, is called libertarian communism or free communism, and achieving that through anarchist means. So explicitly being opposed to uh, parliamentary politics, state, status political parties, uh, rather than just being independent of them. And the reason why anarcho-syndicalism emerges is because of the third international uh, and, and the Russian Revolution, where there's an attempt to take over the syndicalist trade unions and subordinate them to communist parties in their respective countries, even when those communist parties are like tiny and haven't really done anything and have only been formed as part of essentially this attempt by the Bolsheviks to gain control over the, the international left. And so in response to that, there are debates within different trade unions about should we affiliate with the trade union international that is uh, connected and subordinated to the International of Communist Parties, the Third International, uh, or should we go join our own syndicalist international that's explicitly uh, anarchist? Uh, and so the anarcho-syndicalists are those who like, we want an explicitly anarchist union, so we're opposed to uh, the strategies of state socialism, our goal is anarchist communism, uh, and thereby we are distinct from and opposed to the Third International. And one of the largest with not really the largest uh, anarcho-syndicalist trade union ever, is the CNT in Spain. So the, the, the CNT, and again, it isn't like from its birth in like, I think it's founded in like 1910, 1911, off the top of my head, but it isn't, you know, immediately anarcho-syndicalist, but it adopts increasingly anarcho-syndicalist positions over time uh, until it is, you know, formally committed to the principles of, of anarcho-syndicalism although it has many different factions in it who kind of disagree uh, about things and not, not everyone in the union was an anarchist, which sometimes kind of uh, isn't realized. People talk as if, if you're in the CNT, you must have been an anarchist. It's like, well, actually, loads of people were in it because it was the largest trade union in that area. And so they joined because it was the largest trade union and not because they were like a hardcore anarchist. Now, with respect to the CNT, I'm going to discuss 
kind of its attempts to achieve uh, immediate improvements uh, through di through direct action without any kind of electoral struggle, uh, and then also cover how it organised, uh, which I think highlights the practicality of anarchist methods of decision making in a kind of more concrete way uh, than I've hitherto uh, discussed. So, the CNT had a membership of over 800,000 uh, in 1936, and it participated in strikes in uh, lots of different industries, and also crucially, uh, it organized a, a very large uh, rent strike in, in Barcelona, which was defeated due to police repression, where essentially it was, it was uh, made illegal to reoccupy homes that you'd been evicted from. And so it got defeated, but it was still like a, an example of a syndicalist trade union, not just organizing in the workplace, but also organizing in the community. So there's sometimes a kind of people sometimes mistakenly think that, well, it's a trade union, so it just does workplace organizing. It's like, well, actually, no, uh, the CNT did community organizing, such as rent strikes, as well as being interconnected with a lot of uh, community institutions, such as education centers and cafes, and part of its strength was that it was very much grounded in, in communities rather than just workplaces. Now, in terms of a kind of prominent large uh, strike, I'm going to be talking about a strike that happened in 1919. So at the Barcelona offices of uh, the Anglo-American Electricity Company called Elbro Power and Irrigation, a strike uh, begins within this one workplace when workers try to form a union. Uh, the company responds in the way you expect capitalists to do, which is that the workers say we want higher wages uh, and not to be fired. And the you know, capitalists respond by repressing the workers. And so then the CNT joins in and there's an escalation of struggle uh, where there's a strike organized at the company's um, electricity generating plant. Uh, and Barcelona is you know, plunged into darkness. Trams aren't working because there isn't electricity. The city's gas, water, and electricity workers join the strike. Um, and so it kind of expands uh, in size. Uh, there are workers who go on strike who aren't in Barcelona, but in kind of neighboring towns. And it's a kind of core example of a trade union trying to win demands through mobilizing large groups of workers uh, to impose unbearable pressure on the company and the state by direct action, such that they give in to their demands. Uh, and this included workers uh, engaging in uh, sabotage. Uh, so uh, they would uh, sabotage the transformers and power cables, which the company used to try and restore power to the city and thereby break the strike. Um, the printers union, uh, which is affiliated with the CNT, uh, refused to publish any of the Spanish state's proclamations, calling up workers for military service as an attempt to break the strike or articles in the press which, which critiqued the strike. And so they kind of F by, you know, prevented the spread of propaganda or articles which, which, could, which could weaken the power of other workers. And so as a good example of uh, workers in one industry uh, acting in solidarity of workers in another industry in order to pursue their shared class interests. And this strike kind of goes on for a while and it culminates in the Elbro Power and Irrigation Company giving in. They wages workers are increased. Uh, workers are paid for the time that they've been on strike, the union is recognised, the eight-hour day is granted, and workers who lose their job due to the strike are, are reinstated. And it also has an effect on the political ruling class, who are very much kind of afraid of this, the power of the, of the union to mobilise workers. And so the Prime Minister decrees the uh, eight-hour day in the construction industry, which is then going to be you know, expanded to wider industries uh, later. Although even after this legislation is passed, uh, workers still had to go on strike to demand that the law was implemented. Because often what happens is politicians pass laws and then companies don't implement the laws because, like, why would they? And no one's going to stop them unless workers organise and force the law actually to be implemented. Although what then happens, which again highlights how much state repression anarchist trade unions experience, which is that the CNT tries to launch uh, another general strike when a number of political prisoners aren't uh, freed uh, from a place which has a long history of torturing uh, anarchists. Um, 
And in response to this kind of new uh, general strike, the Spanish state is ready and they, you know, immediately impose martial law. They close CNT union headquarters, they arrest loads of people, they censor the press. And then the CNT is forced to kind of call for a return to work. And so this kind of, this strike uh, in 1919 both highlights kind of the power of organized labor. They, they win the entire day, they win immediate improvements through revolutionary direct action without engaging in parliamentary politics. And also shows how the state as the organ of uh, ruling class power uh, will use violence to crush working class resistance uh, by any means. Um, and that's one of the, you know, that's what states exist to do. Now, having kind of illustrated some examples of kind of like militant trade union uh, action, I can now talk about, well, how was the CNT, you know, organized? How do you have a trade union with that many members, you know, hundreds of thousands uh, at its height? It has a few million during the Spanish Revolution. I won't talk about that. Um, I'm just going to talk about how it was organized before the revolution. Although it should be kept in mind that kind of how it's organized changes over time because, you know, it's an organization, organizations change. Uh, and so I'm kind of really talking kind of post-1919. So the basic unit of the CNT is what's called uh, a single union. And a single union unites all workers in a specific industry, irrespective of their profession within the same union. And these single unions have like individual uh, trade sections that would deal with an issue specific to a craft within an industry, but they're not kind of their own separate craft unions, that they're under the umbrella of the, the single union, which organizes on an industrial basis, uh, which means workers in a given workplace are kind of grouped together rather than being like isolated from one, one another based on uh, the division of labor. Now, decisions uh, in the single union are made in a general assembly, which is composed of the entire membership. This general assembly elects a shop steward who has the power to call for work stoppages uh, when the membership instructed uh, them to do so. And they, the general assembly also elects an administrative, administrative committee. Uh, the administrative committee of the single union uh, has a, a number of positions. There's a general secretary, a treasurer you know, do, who deals with the money, uh, an accountant, uh, the first secretary, the second secretary, the third secretary, a librarian, uh, a propaganda delegate, and, and uh, what are called federal delegates. So there's, there's a bunch of different kinds of delegate that they elect. And all the different trade sections within the single union are represented within the administrative, administrative committee to assure, ensure that it's representative of, of the membership rather than it just being the interests of, say, some specific kind of worker uh, as given prominence rather than everyone within the single union. Who performed which role was decided uh, by uh, the members of the administrative committee themselves. So, the admin so you're elected into the administrative committee, but then based on the skills of each member, they decide you know, who's going to do uh, what. The exceptions to this are the general secretary, the treasurer and the federal delegate, who, who's the delegate that represents them within the federation that the single union is part of. And they, they are chosen by the general assembly of the single union, like rather than just being, you're going to be in the administrative committee, figure out which role you'll fill best. Uh, those ones are picked specifically because they're, so, you know, they're arguably the most important. Now, okay, this is very complicated. <laughs> I'm trying to explain it uh, clearly. Okay, so the single union, all the single unions in a particular area combine to form a local federation. The local federation then combines to form a regional federation, and then the regional federations combine to form uh, the national federation. So it's this bottom-up structure where you begin with the smallest units, the single unions, they associate uh, into all the single unions are in a particular local area. Uh, then those local federations then form regional one, regional federations, and then the regional form. Uh, national and all these federations at the level of the local, the regional, and the national, they're self managed by their own uh, administrative uh, committees, which are again, you know, elected by the membership, their delegates. And the important thing to emphasize is that a lot of trade unions develop really large uh, paid bureaucracies, and those bureaucracies then acquire interests which are distinct from the membership such that you end up with conflict between the union bureaucracy and the rank and file over what the trade union should do, whether or not they should go on strike, what tactics they should use during strikes, how militant they should be. 
Uh, and the CN anarchists within the CNT were very worried about a bureaucracy developing for this exact reason. Uh, and as a result, within this huge organization, the only paid delegates within the trade union uh, were the general secretary of the national federation and the secretaries of the, of the regional federations. Every other delegate was expected to earn a living uh, working a trade. So, so it's a union composed of full-time workers, four full-time workers, uh, rather than having this kind of huge bureaucracy that has distinct interests uh, from the working class. The important thing to emphasize about, about the administrative committees is that they lack the ability to impose decisions on shop stewards. Shop, shop stewards who, who, could, who, had, who had the power to call for a stoppage of work, uh, they were subject to instructions by the single union. So the single unions crucially have autonomy over strike action uh, versus the, the, the wider organization. And the role of the, the, the federations was meant to be coordinating action between different single unions, uh, prisoner support, um, correspondence, collecting statistics. Uh, so they, they were kind of they, they they have an administrative role and a role in enabling coordination rather than being this kind of big bureaucracy that runs everything uh, because it's bottom up. The power as much as possible is residing in the single unions. And although it's kind of more complicated than that, because there are periods of state repression where the CNT is illegal and, so, and, and, and then the, the committees kind of have to do more things than they otherwise would do because it's hard to organize a union when the state is kind of you know, repressing everyone and people don't want to go to prison. Okay, now, so that, that's the kind of structure, but then how would kind of decisions made beyond the general uh, um, assemblies of the single union? Uh, and so what would happen is that there would be uh, regional congresses attended by delegates representing the local federations on a uh, yearly basis. And then kind of the, the, there would also be national congresses, although the, the, the how many were called kind of varied um, based on, you know, circumstances to do with state repression. And the national uh, congress was attended by every single uh, union of the uh, entire organization. And so obviously, you know, what happens between the regional congresses that are yearly and the national congresses, which kind of occur on a more sporadic uh, basis. They, they occur every few years, but it's it's not kind of like clockwork because of various factors like the CNT being illegal for long periods of time. And so between the national congresses, which, you know, are attended by mandated delegates, you know, not, not representatives, delegates who are mandated on what to vote and what positions to take by the single union that has elected them. But between the national congresses, uh, decisions in the CNT, which involve multiple uh, single unions, uh, are made at what are called plenums, which is when uh, the federal delegate, which, uh, which were part of the single union's administrative committee, uh, they attend uh, a meeting of the plenum, again mandated, uh, in which they kind of formulate proposals and agreements with other federal delegates of the single union. They then go back. Uh, to their single union with, you know, what was said at the meeting and what was agreed upon. And the single union then can either, you know, can, can agree with what happened and, and, and go along with it, or, or they can say if the, you know, the delegate hasn't done as instructed, they can still be like, well, no, that's not what we wanted you to do. And they're not kind of forced to uh, follow what was agreed upon because the, you know, the delegate wasn't actually representing what, what they had asked. And there are also then in turn uh, plenums at a regional level attended by federal delegates for the local federations. And within the CNT, decisions were made uh, through a majority vote in which it was expected that the, the decisions are, are binding on, on members if they participate in that decision-making process, because without that, they think that the organization would kind of fall apart. Although affinity groups associated with the CNT, which are kind of small informal groups, five to kind of 20 people, uh, they usually made decisions by what's, what they called, what we today call consensus, uh, which is where everyone has to agree in order for the decision uh, to occur, uh, rather than a, a system of safe majority voting, where it's like 75% of people have to vote in favour of a proposal. So 
That's how the CNT organized over several decades while experiencing loads of state repression with memberships in the hundreds of thousands uh, effectively uh, and, and were so effective that they were, you know, suffered huge amounts of state repression uh, is because they were a genuine threat to ruling class power. And I think, I, and it's, it's one of those things where it's like, it's, it's, it can be weirdly clunky to try to explain in words how an organization was, uh, you know, structured, but it's kind of more easy to understand when you're actually in the organization and this is just how we do things. And in, in organizing in this way, they were trying to prefigure how an anarchist society would be organized, which means they're trying to, as much as possible, create the social structures and relations that are um, the same as what would exist in an anarchist society and thereby create through a process of experimentation, you know, how things could exist in a free society. Uh, and, that, and they were in so doing uh, also learning how to self-manage. Uh, so the idea is, is that you participate in the CNT and in so doing, you're learning how to live in an anarchist society because you're learning how to coordinate through plenums and federations, how to make decisions in general assemblies, how to, uh, you're learning a huge number of skills uh, and acquiring loads of new ideas through participating in this kind of, uh, you know, what a modern person might call direct democracy um, within uh, the union. And thereby they're becoming the kinds of people who can actually create an anarchist society because they already know how to, you know, make decisions uh, in general assemblies and organized by federations. And so it's not just a kind of, the reason why they're organizing this way isn't just because, oh, we're principled anarchists, this is what means we're free. It's also for a very practical reason that if a social movement isn't organizing in a way that prefigures the, their goal of an anarchist society, then workers aren't actually going to learn the skills they need to create an anarchist society, which means an anarchist society isn't going to be created. Um, so it's actually for very practical reasons that they were doing this, rather than just due to say some kind of, you know, we should be free within our organization, which they did think, but it was it was more than that. So yeah, that that covers the, the CNT. Um, any other questions? <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I guess as as we as we move towards winding down, there's a couple of things that I want to ask here, and then maybe Tsiamo can pipe in too. But um, historical anarchist views on on technology um, would be uh, interesting uh, here, and we have in mind. Uh, I don't expect because I know you you're specializing in an earlier time period, um, but obviously we're on the podcast concerned with technology today, but I think that there are obvious themes about um, technology in, in general. And also um, the issue of maybe e either one you want to pick to do first, but nationalization of property. And, and the reason we're bringing this up is, you know, people are talking about doing things like nationalizing Amazon and, you know, maybe some of the big tech companies and nationalizing property could put it does put it into the hands of the state. So from my perspective, putting Amazon, for example, into the hands of the imperialist US government is not uh, something that I would consider a socialist thing to do. And it's not something that I would consider um, as good as those who have advocated it. I don't think the social the outcome would be as good as uh, they seem to suggest. Now, I can picture in that scenario, uh, some nationalization of property, which exists within a mixed capitalist economy, right? But then there's also a full-on kind of extreme nationalization where maybe all of your industry is for the most part nationalized into the hands of the state. Why would anarchists be against nationalization in that respect? So yeah, nationalization and um, tech. Okay, so first I'll talk about technology and then I'll cover nationalization. So historically, anarchists pointed out that under capitalism, technology is not used neutrally, but in order to maximize short-term profit. And this has lots of, uh, this has lots of negative effects. Uh, so improvements in technology cause workers to lose their jobs as they're replaced uh, with machines. Or the, the French anarchist Elise Reclus, who was a geographer, he noted the manner in which one technology um, was used in capitalist workplaces, such as factories. It had the effect that workers were reduced to cogs in a machine. Uh, so they you know, became appendages to the machine 
uh, rather than production being geared around their needs and interests as human beings, they were being forced to kind of work around the needs of maximizing the efficient usage of the machine to maximize short-term profit, irrespective of the, the human cost. Uh, and the clue focused not only on the effects on uh, humans, but also on the natural environment. And so he, he wrote about the ecological impact of technology under capitalism uh, in the 19th century. Uh, when often it's assumed it's kind of like only modern people would think about this. It's like, well, no historic uh, radicals were so concerned about environmental destruction. And this included, you know, deforestation, species extinction uh, and air pollution. Although obviously, you know, we now know a lot about global warming, which say wasn't uh, known about to the same extent uh, historically. So in 1866, I think there's a very good quote by Rucli, I'll quickly read out where he says that, it matters little to the industrialist operating his mine or factory in the middle of the countryside, whether he blackens the atmosphere with fumes from the coal or contaminates it with foul smelling vapors. In Western Europe, not to mention England, there are a great many industrial valleys whose thick smoke is almost unbreathable to outsiders. The homes there are filled with smoke and even the leaves on the trees are coated with soot. The sun almost always shows its yellowish face through a thick haze. And he also talks about how this, you know, decreases uh, life expectancy. And so historical anarchists are very much aware of the way in which uh, technology can have a negative effect on both human beings, uh, non-human animals, uh, and the natural world. Uh, but they didn't think that this was kind of the inevitable effect of technology. It was a consequence of technology within the framework of capitalism and the state and other systems of oppression. And they thought that in a kind of anarchist socialist society, technology could be used to achieve uh, emancipation uh, and satisfy human need rather than maximize short term profit. Uh, so, for example, you know, improvements in technology can mean that people work less uh, and have more free time to pursue their hobbies or they no longer have to engage in dangerous or uh, unpleasant labor because it's been automated or it's been made much safer through uh, technology. Because when you're not long, when you're not concerned with just profits, you can also loads of other things become uh, realistic possibilities in a way that they're not to a capitalist who has to outcompete their rivals um, at, at all costs. Otherwise, the, the, the business will collapse. Or to give another example, you can use technology to expand people's possibilities to develop themselves. So, for example, you know the technology of prosthetic legs enables disabled people to participate in you know, loads of different sports or daily life in a way that they wouldn't be able to without that technology. And so the technology expands uh, their freedom to develop themselves and to, to kind of live their life. And so anarchists didn't have this kind of crude view of, you know, technology bad. It's like, well, you know, so obviously some technology might be inherently harmful. Like I would argue, say, like nuclear bombs, you know, bad. Um, but other technology, it can be used both uh, to you know, destroy human lives, but in a different economic context can be used to actually uh, further um, the well-being of human beings. And Reclus in particular advocated uh, using technology and science to kind of alter the natural world in an economic, ecologically sustainable manner uh, rather than destructive manner. And he thought that human labor could enhance the beauty of the natural world while, rather than it kind of you know, if humans interfere with nature, that's bad. It's like, well, he thinks humans are a part of nature and we can actually enhance nature rather than just, say, uh, destroying it. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why he's committed to you know, abolishing capitalism. Uh, so, for example, he writes that um, there's been a reckless system which has defaced nature's beauty and that given this, uh, humans should endeavour to restore it and repair the injuries committed by our predecessors. And he defines the goal of progress as um, developing the continents, the seas and the atmosphere that surround us to cultivate our garden on earth, to rearrange and regulate the environment in order to promote each individual plant, animal and human life, to become fully conscious of our human solidarity, forming one body with the planet itself, which I think is a kind of a, a vision that is still relevant given, you know, ongoing destruction of the natural environment. It's like we're in a situation where humans have to actually undo a lot of the damage that has been done, which requires uh, intervention into nature in order to uh, restore it and un undo all the damage that kind of capitalist industry 
has done, uh, such as you know reforesting. Now, as for nationalisation, uh, that's a really uh, large topic, and I'll just kind of briefly cover what historical anarchists thought, and then say some things that I think. So historically, which is before uh, attempts at kind of large scale you know, uh, state central planned economies that have happened. This is when they're being advocated, but haven't been implemented. Although there are, you know, early kind of state nationalization uh, occurring or uh, state controlled uh, businesses, such as some kind of post offices, for example, um, which they're familiar with. Now, anarchists thought that if, the, if, if you have state nationalization at a societal level, you will have what they called state capitalism rather than socialism. So the reason why they called it state capitalism was because capitalism is an economic system in which a minority of capitalists own the means of production and compel the majority of the population to work for them to survive. Workers lack control over the productive process and they lack decision-making power. Uh, decisions are ultimately going to be made by capitalists, by managers, by shareholders, and so on. And if the state is a centralized and hierarchical institution, wielded by a minority, so politicians, high-ranking bureaucrats. The consequence of this is that if the state owns and controls the uh, economy entirely or the majority of it or you know, key industries, then what this actually means is that a small minority of people at the top of a hierarchy own and control the economy rather than the workers they claim to represent. Um, under such a system, workers labor for the state to earn a wage, and lack either ownership or control over the productive process. So as opposed to a situation where you have loads of different individual capitalists or private firms competing with each other, uh, you instead have uh, a large national capitalist, the state, um, which takes on the role of those individual capitalists in terms of subordinating the working class and controlling production, which is then, say, in uh, economic competition with other uh, national capitalists in, in other countries. And this isn't the abolition of class society, this is a reconfiguration of class society. And this is grounded in the anarchist rejection of the idea that you can never have a state, which is, say, genuinely based on the self-rule of workers. Because if you think that, well, we can have a state which is that, then state ownership can make sense as a means to achieve emancipation of the working class. Um, because if you're working for the state and the state is ruled by the workers, then really you're just working uh, as a worker with other workers you're not being oppressed, well, anarchists reject the possibility of that and think that what will actually happen, which is what actually did happen, uh, which is that you have a minority of bureaucrats, politicians, uh, party leadership, who will be the actual ones who in practice own and control the economy and sub subordinate and dominate the workers, even if on paper uh, or in, in word, it's meant to be the case that, you know, this is a workers republic where the workers are free and aren't being oppressed and exploited. That doesn't actually describe the reality uh, on the ground. It's just a kind of, it's a change of language and, a ch and you know, changing the colour of flags, but it isn't changing the fundamental class dynamics and isn't achieving the anarchist goal and the goal of you know, socialism for anarchists, which is workers themselves owning and self-managing the economy uh, through federations of, of general assemblies, uh, which enable workers to actually control their lives and thereby be free. Uh, so that's briefly the historical anarchist view. Now, under current conditions, I think there's some kind of nationalization which can be superior to private capitalist firms. So I think the obvious example is, you know, universal state to state healthcare is much better than the American private healthcare system uh, and much better for uh, workers. And so that is like a good thing relative to an alternative under capitalism. But it doesn't mean that that should be our goal for an emancipated society or that there aren't any you know, problems with uh, state universal healthcare systems. You know, they have loads of issues. So, for example, in, in the UK, uh, the National Healthcare Service is extremely bad for uh, providing trans people with healthcare. There are unbelievably long waiting lists to get uh, basic kind of medical needs met for trans people, such as hormones. And so I'm not saying you know, this, these are like perfect, we shouldn't critique them, just that, yeah, free state healthcare is better than uh, having to go through insurance companies and or not having insurance and being in huge amounts of medical debt and being afraid of going to the hospital because you can't afford it. Uh, 
or to give her another example, in a society where kind of the welfare state has become the only realistic means for, say, disabled people to have an independent life, then under existing conditions, protecting that welfare state uh, is very important because the immediate alternative is loads of disabled people dying, which has actually happened in the UK due to state austerity programs against specifically uh, benefits to disabled people, where a privatised company would rule disabled people, as many disabled people as possible, fit for work, even though they were not fit for work and were you know, very ill and were unable to work. Uh, and they would then lose their benefits and uh, would experience you know, huge amounts of stress. Uh, people would sometimes kill themselves. Uh, it was ruled uh, to be you know, a systematic violation of the human rights of, this, of the disabled. Well, in this context, it's like, hell yeah, I want disabled people to have really good state uh, welfare benefits, even though I want a society where production is organized such that disabled people can guarantee their means of existence uh, without having to rely on the state, but where it's provided for them by a, a socialist economy based on worker self-management. But I think, you know, it's a really case by case thing. And so, yeah, I don't think Amer the American government nationalizing Amazon would be a good thing. Um, <laughs> I, I think it very much like varies. And in terms of things to kind of struggle for, uh, I think there are kind of better things that social movements should be focusing on building up working class power um, rather than kind of hoping for, you know, Amazon to, to become nationalized. Um, I think they should be focusing on, you know, organizing Amazon workers at the point of production to overthrow uh, our overlord, um, Bezos. Uh, and that's distinct, say, from the need to protect welfare states from austerity programs. Crucially, not through parliamentary means, but through direct action outside of and against the state by mass working class social movements. And uh, maybe one more question. Um, in regards to reform and regulation if you're looking at being an anarchist and you say well what do i do uh, i think a lot of political activity winds up being geared towards electoral politics because you can join a party and uh, a lot of uh, energies are also pushed towards regulation and reforms because there's something that can make a concrete difference in somebody's lives. So for example, pushing for raising the minimum wage. So obviously, you know, you can join unions and, but if you're an anarchist, when it's clear that regulations are needed, for example, to protect the environment against plunder, um, you know, safety regulations, all sorts of things like that, somebody might turn back to you and say, well, but why don't you then just participate in electoral politics and get a party in there that's going to be receptive to the kinds of things that you want? So I guess my question here is, what do you make of pushing for regulations? And more generally, if you're persuaded by the anarchist critique of power what is there for people to do on a day-to-day -day basis um, besides something like joining a union or maybe try to educate other people about the nature of power? Okay, so I have a few points. So the first point is that um, electoral politics, uh, it, it's not sufficient to win immediate improvements. So parties get elected and then they don't deliver on their promises. As mentioned earlier, you know, there are loads of examples in the history of European socialism of socialist politicians using state uh, violence to repress strikes, even though these are the people who were meant to be, uh, you know, friendlier on the side of workers and, you know, uh, and, and helping them. Or, you know, to give a recent example, Syriza in Greece was uh, elected uh, in order to, you know, counteract the austerity programs, but due to the objective situations they were in. Uh, they ended up furthering uh, austerity programs. Uh, so just because you elect a party in who makes various promises doesn't mean any of those promises are going to be actually implemented. When political parties do deliver on some of their promises, which is very rare, uh, it's due to external pressure created by extra parliamentary social movements, such as uh, uh, trade union movements or the ruling classes being afraid of social revolution. So we're seeing you know, one of the key factors for 
the reason why there are um, welfare states is because the ruling classes were generally afraid following the Russian revolution of there being you know glo global communist revolutions happening and so the uh, and so there were various demands of workers movements that were granted in order to uh, uh, as a kind of compromise as a way to prevent that from happening and what's happened which is that as those extra parliamentary social movements have been smashed such as trade union movement and as of the political parties that say were involved in some of this have you know became less and less radical over time and more and more um, capitalist, as the anarchists predicted, those two processes in parallel have resulted in the increasing, you know, destruction and, and attacks on uh, these kind of victories won by by previous struggles. And uh, nor is it the case that parliamentary politics is a necessary condition to ach achieve a media improvement. So it's both not sufficient. Like when it happens, it's the coincidence of loads of different factors, including extra parliamentary movements and, you know, ruling class being afraid of revolution and, and so on. But I also don't think it's a necessary condition because we have loads of examples of anarchist and syndicalist social movements winning a media improvements via direct action uh, without engaging in or being supported by electoral politics. And this includes not just things at the level of say, you know, we want a wage increase in a workplace, but also changes uh, to the law or imposing uh, demands on, on government, such as you know, the, the weekend in France was one for a general strike, or the entire day in Spain, even the vote itself, you know, before, before electoral politics existed, is like, well, how did people win the votes? Like, well, to a huge extent through direct action. So for example, as far as I recall in Belgium, there was a huge general strike and that played a key role in the achievement of, of, of um, universal suffrage. And so we have loads of evidence of achieving these immediate improvements purely through direct action. And therefore that shows that the parliamentary politics isn't a necessary condition, as well as, as I've said, it not being a sufficient condition. As for how kind of anarchists should think about uh, you know, reforms and, and which ones to, to struggle on. I can kind of say what anarchists historically thought, and I kind of leave it up to people to figure out how they think this can be applied to kind of current situations, because, you know, I'm an expert on the history of anarchism. I don't know a huge amount about other things in, in existing society. So what they thought, and this wasn't all anarchists, this is one particular strain of anarchism historically, uh, such as Kropotkin, Malatesta, Bakunin. Um, what they thought was that, so you you, the, the, the struggle for reforms should be the means through which you generate a social movement that is capable and driven to launch a revolution. And so you should focus on reforms which can actually build up that social movement. So, if, you know, for example, in their context, they didn't think a reform we should focus on was universal suffrage, because that's a reform that will lead towards electoral politics and the recuperation of socialist movements into the state and into the and being negatively affected by that. And so therefore, they, should, they shouldn't engage in reforms that are reformist in the sense that they uh, won't build towards revolution um, and are premised on the idea that we can kind of you know, reform capitalism away. They're like, no, we have to choose reforms that can build towards revolution and build the power of the working classes to, 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 to achieve that. And that's why they focus so much on trade unions, uh, historically, as the means to build up that power. And... You should also, you know, choose means within those struggles for reforms and organize in the manner that that is uh, doing that. So you should be engaging in direct action outside of and against the state. So the struggle for reform doesn't get entangled with the state and then you end up, no, the movement stops being revolutionary and becomes absorbed into existing power structures. Uh, and that's the kind of typical way social movements, you know, uh, get defeated is they kind of pick a few leaders and be like, we're going to give you the illusion of power and influence and then nothing will actually change but you'll get like a bigger media platform and and so to avoid that process of recuperation you know, you've got to, they think social media should be, should be focusing on militancy and direct action and developing a consciousness of opposition to the ruling class and to the police and so on uh, and they should also be prefiguring uh, the social structures of an anchor society so that people to be myself are kind of learning how to uh, make decisions and coordinate in a manner that is the same as what would exist in anarchist society, such that they become able to actually create a free society.
uh, and also acquire the drive to create that kind of society. Because, you know, it's one thing to read about it, but when you've actually experienced like functioning uh, general assemblies, that can have a profound effect on what you think is politically uh, possible. Uh, and then that can in turn shape the kind of society you think can be created. I think that with respect to kind of our immediate context, obviously the thing to focus on is climate change, um, which isn't to say other things shouldn't be focused on, just that it's one of the obvious, you know, biggest things. Uh, and given that it's not likely that a revolution is going to happen in time, uh, we have to operate in the time scale of preventing uh, the damage of how catastrophic the effects of climate change are going to be. Uh, the institution in our society which can stop capitalists from doing things they otherwise uh, would do is the state through regulation. And so I think it can make sense to try to, for social movements to try to push for greater state regulation, although the, the issue again is doing so in a manner where you don't end up getting absorbed into the state but remain outside of and against it. And so therefore I think it, you have to focus on direct action which causes disruption and which prevents the normal functioning of things such that there is so much pressure on the ruling classes that they're forced to give in to demands. And from history, you know that in order to, for that to happen, that can happen with, with you know, all different kinds of government, dictatorships and democracies. Um, and so it, it, so I don't think it, I, I, I'm not persuaded by the argument that, you know, we should focus on electoral politics to have a friendly face. It's like, no, we should be focusing on developing working class power. So they're capable of imposing as much external pressure on the ruling class as possible, such they're forced to give into our demands, irrespective of you know how those politicians think of themselves ideologically. See, so, yeah, I hope that some way answers your question. But I'm always kind of weary of like, you know, being like, this is what you should do, because it's like, I just know a huge amount about the history of socialism. <laughs> and I try to focus on talking about the thing I know a lot about rather than making the mistake of being like, well, I know a lot about this thing, so I know a lot about everything, and everyone should listen to me, because I've read books. It's like, I'm, I'm always worried about <laughs> falling into that trap. Yeah, so I think we're all really forgiving, because we do know any advice offered comes from context, comes from particular readings and experiences of the world, and all locations are a bit different. And you might take a general universal rule, like, you know, improve worker power, and have to find your own way to actualize that in the context in which you live. I do agree that there's a lot of historical examples. I mean, for the audience, you know, if you want to see some documentaries, you can watch one called The Take that's set in Argentina, um, a documentary about workers that overtook um, a textile factory and formed a worker cooperative. You can watch a documentary called Coconut Revolution, which is uh, set in the Pacific Islands, Bourneville Island, I think specifically, about um, uh, you know these islanders who resisted uh, RTZ Rio Tinto's uh, mining operations. You know it's called one of the most successful eco revolutions. So that also answers the environmental question. Uh, you can also see a documentary called um, "Woman Hold Up the Sky," which is set in three African countries that looks at resistance to um, environmental colonialism and um, capitalist operations like mining in South Africa, in Uganda, and I believe in Kenya. So it, it, yeah, there's, there's a, a swath of examples and movements that we can learn from. And I do appreciate that you did mention that there are a lot of movements, some of whom don't even call themselves anarchists that we can learn from. I think in closing, you know, I don't have any questions anymore, but I just have some comments. Like, uh, I think it was quite amazing that you distinguished anarchism. I think what happens with a lot of our politics especially because of electoral politics, is we, we wrap ourselves in to these minimum goal-oriented uh, thinking, like, oh, okay, between this political party and this political party and these two candidates, who's better? Let's vote for a lesser evil. And a lot of conversations end up really, uh, really absorbed in these everyday little battles that we're fighting. And there isn't this grand sort of politics that we're organizing our lives under, direct action, mutual aid, um, worker power, and how we can reorganize our economy and how we can move in that direction. And a lot of those seem maybe unrealistic or not worthy of talking about, but because we don't talk about it, we never orient our politics, at least in that direction, even when it comes to the small little discussions we're having. Uh, I also liked how positive this discussion has been. Like, what is anarchism? 
you know, what is multiple layers? How does it distinguish itself from other left radical forms of organizing? It seems a lot of us on the left seem to do more distinguishing ourselves from the social democrats and the right wing folks, but not a lot of distinguishing among ourselves and the di different approaches we can have even within radical traditions. And, and then finally, I thought the historical information is very useful, especially because uh, the predictions that were made in the past coming true should be a, a really good reason why lots of people should respect anarchist thinking, its ability to understand the world and how the world has progressed into what it has become right now, I think is valuable. Um, so I, I guess I just want to say thank you, Zoe, for coming on, for giving us a lot of that historical information, and uh, especially for you know, this really broad you know, view that accounts for different contexts around the world, bringing in a lot of the Asian view, which I don't see being discussed a lot in regards to anarchism and responses to Japanese imperialism, for instance. I think anyone, regardless of where you are in the world, can really learn a lot from the anarchist tradition. I do recommend that you get involved in local anarchist groups or starting one if there aren't any. And also knowing that anarchist groups can obviously always be started. You know, we can always begin now. Yeah, so that's my, that's my commentary. And um, hopefully we do avert the global climate catastrophe. I hope so. <laughs> uh, that would be good. But uh, it will only happen if we try, is the thing. Uh, it won't happen by itself. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me and asking uh, good questions. And uh, I was happy to come on and kind of uh, try and explain uh, anarchist history. <laughs>